In this video, I will examine the fragmentary writings of one of the most important early Greek philosophers, Heraclitus, who flourished around 500 BCE. Little is known about Heraclitus' life, and what little has come down to us is probably just apocryphal stories. However, what appears to be true is that he was born in Ephesus, the most prominent city on the coast of Asia Minor, or modern-day Turkey. This is close to the so-called birthplace of Greek philosophy in Miletus, and its proximity has triggered scholarly debate regarding how much his ideas it were influenced by the ideas of the primordial substances that are developed by Talus, Anaximander, and Anaxanemes. During his own time, Heraclitus was not well liked, and his philosophy was not particularly popular, although it did provoke critical thought at least in those who opposed him. Yet. Despite this lack of early critical acclaim, the few fragments which survived into modern times were still profoundly influential on European philosophy in the 19th and 20th centuries, particularly on German thinkers such as Hegel, Engels, Nietzsche, and Heidegger. The first thing that I should note about Heraclitus is that his written work has not survived intact down to this day. Later authors stated that he wrote a single book, which in those days would have meant a single papyrus scroll, which he then deposited at the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus. What has survived down to this day are so-called fragments of his work. These fragments aren't literal scraps of papyrus or shards of stone tablets, but rather quotations by later authors that represent in at least part Heraclitus' thought. In the early 1900s, the fragments of Heraclitus and many other early Greek philosophers were collected in a book written by Hermann Alexander Diels called De Fragmenta de Socratica, or in English, The Fragments of the Pre-Socratics, a now controversial name used collectively for those Greek thinkers who came before the watershed of Socrates. This book was later updated by Walther Krantz in the 1930s. Diels and Krantz used a numbering system to order these fragments for easy reference, now called the Diel Krantz or DK numbers. These are still widely in use, and as such, when I make reference to specific fragments in this video, this is the number which I'll be making reference to. One other thing to note is that because of the lack of a singular primary source and the potentially fraudulent nature of some of these fragments, the interpretation of Heraclitus' philosophy remains controversial, and I'll point out some of these controversies and give my own take on them throughout. The idea that Heraclitus is most known for is his doctrine of flux. Principally, this is the idea that all things are constantly changing and never in a single state of nature or essence. Interestingly, similar ideas would be discussed in the Buddhist tradition and become a key point of doctrinal controversy between the early Buddhist schools around a century after the death of both Buddha and Heraclitus. The fragment which best espouses this view of flux is probably B12. You cannot step twice into the same river, for fresh waters are ever flowing upon you. What this appears to mean is that although you can step into the river, at each individual moment of time the current has brought new waters, thus irrevocably changing the river. At an even deeper level, one could argue that the current's flow has ever so slightly stripped the riverbed, eroded the riverbanks, and fed the surrounding foliage in a way that means the entire environment is constantly being altered, and at every specific moment is impossible to recreate. One of the first scholarly debates which has emerged is to whether or not this change that Heraclitus is talking about is destructive, leading to the cessation of an object's identity, or continuous, in that the change is necessary but does not alter the identity of the object. I fall into the former camp and believe that the fragment B36 best supports this position of destructive change, for it is death to souls to become water, and death to water to become earth but water comes from earth, and from water, soul. This doctrine of flux was rejected by later Greco-Roman thinkers, including Plato and Aristotle. It was charged that this theory would reject a solid basis for reality and truth, such as Plato sought to find in his forms, or Aristotle and substance. This led to such critics suggesting the theory of flux undermined identity and being. In some ways, Heraclitus does seem to condemn conventional ideas of distinction as seen in fragment B61. 
Sea is the purest and most polluted of waters. For fish drinkable and healthy, for men undrinkable and harmful. However, despite condemning conventional understandings of difference, right and wrong, Heraclitus clearly believes in a deep underpinning unity of all things, probably drawing from the primordial substance ideas that Milesians had discussed and feeding into later monists such as Parmenides, although which of the two came first is controversial. Heraclitus is forceful in his argument that opposites at, by convention are unified in reality, as seen in fragment B88. And it is the same thing in us that is quick and dead, awake and asleep, young and old. The former are shifted and become the latter, and the latter in turn are shifted and become the former. Heraclitus clearly sees the opposites within the unity as unified through common participation in the same whole reflexively bending back upon itself. This is illustrated in fragment B51. They do not comprehend how being at variance it agrees with itself. It is a harmony turning back upon itself like a bow or a lyre. Heraclitus's theory leads to the question, if everything is constantly changing and opposites are unified despite their conventional differences, then what is this substrate which underpins the everyday world of objects and experience? Some scholars suggest that Heraclitus had solved this by placing him amongst the Milesian school of primordial substances, because some of these fragments appear to indicate that all things are based and born upon fire, including fragment B90, all things are interchanged for fire, and fire for all things, just like goods for gold and gold for goods. And fragment B30, this world, which is the same for all, no one of gods or men has made, but it always was, is, and will be, an ever-living fire, with measures of its kindling and measures going out. However, an alternate interpretation is that by elevating fire as the primordial substance, Heraclitus is actually making an ironic criticism of the primordial schools. Fire was recognised by the other Milesians as the most mercurial and changing of the elements, and thus by elevating it above the more stable substances, perhaps Heraclitus was instead highlighting the importance of flux over any one fixed substrate. The repeated use of the motive of fire has led some modern scholars to claim that Heraclitus was either influenced by or derivative from the Zoroastrian faith of the Persian Empire, of which his city of Ephesus was a part. However, I would reject this assertion for two primary reasons. Firstly, although fire is an important aspect of Zoroastrianism as the supreme symbol of purity, the Zoroastrians are not fire worshippers, as some Westerners wrongly believe. The fire is instead a representation of the light of God, being Ahura Mazda, as well as the illuminated mind. This is fundamentally different from the idea of fire as a primordial substance, if this even is what Heraclitus was attempting to teach. Secondly, to claim that the motive of fire could only have been drawn from the Zoroastrian religion ignores the shared Indo-European legacy of sacrificial flame used by the Greeks and the Indo-Aryans, as demonstrated in the epics of Homer and the Vedic hymns. In fact, the Persians share part of the same cultural legacy, although the pure nature of the flame in Zoroastrian worship meant that the offerings made to them were usually sandalwood or some other sweet-smelling lumber rather than meat, bones, or ghee. Yet, beyond these practical issues of transmission, the theology which Heraclitus presents is as unique from the Persians as it is from his conventional religion of his Greek peers. Despite the omnipresence of flux, he sees the divine as transcending the change, representing the unity of opposites as seen in fragment B67. God is day and night, winter and summer, war and peace, hunger and fullness, but he takes various shapes just as fire, when it is mingled with spices, is named according to the savour of each. The divine representation in fire appears to be mirrored in Heraclitus' conception of the soul. This is shown by the attributes of the nature of fire from earlier Milesian philosophy, namely dryness, being given to the soul in fragment B118. A dry gleam of light is the wisest and best soul. 
Wetness is presented as the pleasurable and witless form of the soul, both alluded to in fragment 36 above, referring to water as death to the soul, and in reference to intoxication in fragment B117. A man, when he gets drunk, is led by a beardless lad, tripping, knowing not which way he steps, and having his soul moist. What is clear, at least from these fragments, is that Heraclitus sees the soul as the focal point of thought and mental life. Furthermore, these fragments seem to hint at the similarity between the soul, the divine, and fire as flux. This potentially indicates a position of coexistence, or at least participation between the divine and the individual soul, perhaps hinted at in fragment B45. You will not find the boundaries of the soul by travelling in any direction so deep is the measure of it. Furthermore, the divine is not merely a passive substrate within Heraclitus's conception, and he makes a reference to the divine power and will in fragment 64. Thunderbolt steers all things. This allusion to Zeus, often represented by the thunderbolt, I would argue in the context of his earlier fragments, should not be seen as merely a conventional platitude regarding the Olympic gods, but rather potentially an argument that a pantheistic divine is the cause and maintainer of constant flux. If we accept that Heraclitus is arguing for a pantheistic divine, his comments concerning justice are put into context. As mentioned in the discussion of his theory of flux, he rejects the conventional understandings of value, as seen in fragment B102. To God, all things are fair and good and just, but men hold some things wrong and some right. And he identifies the necessity of destruction implied in his doctrine of change, as seen in fragment B80. We must know that war is common to all and strife is justice, and that all things come into being through strife necessarily. However, despite rejecting conventional morality, Heraclitus doesn't embrace relativism, clearly demonstrating a somewhat haughty aristocratic ethic which spurns the ideas of the common man. He exalts the superior individual, as in fragment B49. One good man is worth 10,000 ordinary people, and in fragment B121, stating that the adult citizens of Ephesus should hang themselves, every one, and leave the city to children, since they have banished Hermodorus, a man preeminent among them, saying, let no one stand out among us, or let him stand out elsewhere among others. Clearly, this is a condemnation of the democratic ideals which were developing in some of the Ionian city-states, most notably Athens, prior to and during his lifetime. Heraclitus's rejection of popular opinion is more than a quibbling of a stuffy elitist. It points to an even deeper suspicion of so-called common-sense knowledge, exemplified in fragment B70, Human opinions are children's toys, and fragment B34, Hearing they do not understand, like the deaf, of them does the saying bear witness, present they are absent. Furthermore, he is not merely a reactionary conservative, as his position lends him and leads him to criticise the poets of Hesiod and Homer, whose works form the basis of Greek religious practice and theology, seen in fragments 56 and 57. Although these fragments indicate a rejection of conventional knowledge, it is not immediately clear how Heraclitus would expect this superior intellect to pursue truth. In fact, in some fragments, he appears to revel in the apparent obscurantism of the world, such as in fragment B123, Nature Loves to Hide, and fragment B93, The Lord, who is the oracle at Delphi, neither speaks nor hides his meaning, but gives a sign. However, despite this apparent mistrust, even of his own knowledge, Heraclitus doesn't appear to have adopted a sceptical position. Instead, beyond the veil of mystery, he appears to posit a form of monism that is implied in his cosmology of fire and unity and opposites, as seen in fragment B50. Having hearkened not to me, but to the Logos, it is wise to agree that all things are one. Now, the term logos here is often being translated as word in this context, but the question remains, who or what is this word? Is it the active part of the divine that permeates all things? 
Is it the intellect behind the all-consuming fire? Is it perhaps synonymous with the principle of flux which drives all things forward? The longest fragment of Heraclitus, B1, is actually dedicated to both the words being, but also humanity's inability to understand it. Of this words being forever do men prove to be uncomprehending, both before they hear and once they have heard it. For although all things happen according to this word, they are, like the unexperienced, experiencing words and deeds such as I explain when I distinguish each thing according to its nature and show how it is. Other men are unaware of what they do when they are awake, just as they are forgetful of what they do when they are asleep. It is my belief that Heraclitus's position is that the word, fire, flux, opposites, divinity, and the soul are all manifestations of the same single whole, and this is his great contribution to philosophy. His unitary view of reality and questioning of the conventional ideas of the solidness of our tangible reality points towards the deeper questioning which has infused the search for answers ever since.